Hi, I'm Jeff Sickinga, Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center, and this is The American Idea, where we discuss the ideas, people, and events that have made America what it is today. We believe that by understanding our history and our principles, we can better live up to the promise of the American founding and preserve our ongoing experiment in self-government. Welcome to The American Idea. In this special episode of The American Idea, Jeff Sickinga of the Ashbrook Center moderates a panel discussion between the mayors of four small towns in Ohio. The topic they discuss is the importance of good local government and good civics at the local level. We often talk about national and international big picture issues, but we should never lose sight of the importance of what's going on in our neighborhoods and down the street. Thanks as always for listening to The American Idea. One of the questions that I think some folks, we have such a variety of, of, of cities represented here, geographic regions, that sort of thing. Sometimes people ask, what does a mayor do? Uh, and I think it depends somewhat on the kind of city you have, what kind of constitutional structure you have in your city. Maybe we could just start with you, Mayor. Uh, what's the constitutional structure of the mayor's office there? What powers do you have? What do you do? So the city of Barberton has, a, uh, with, through our charter, our strong mayor form of government. Uh, we have a city council. We're a little different because our law director and finance director are both separately elected as well. Uh, but some people think that we have all the power as mayor. Some people think that we have zero power. So maybe somewhere in between. Um, every day is a little different. Um, Barberton is a small community, nine square miles, 26,000 residents. But we have our own reservoir and water treatment center and wastewater treatment center. So we have a lot of the big city things, full-time police, fire, about 250 employees. So we all deal with the same types of issues, just at different levels, right? So every day is a little different, a little exciting. Um, you never know uh, what's going to happen. We're not experts in anything, but we know a lot about a lot of different things. So whether it's stormwater mitigation to workforce development to, you know, police or fire. So there's a lot of things that we deal with on a daily basis. How about, how about for the city of Mansfield? So actually, ditto. We are uh, also a strong mayor format, independently elected finance director and law director. City Council, uh, we also have uh, the municipal court um, that services uh, two-thirds of Richland County as well. So interesting, uh, obviously I'm just elected last week. Um, we actually have a completely new slate of city leaders coming in. So we have term limits in our charter, uh, mayor, uh, finance director, law director, city council, you can do three, four-year terms. So almost our entire city leadership is, is turning over. Um, and I think the opportunity for us is we can come in together, build some uh, fresh relationships, um, and uh, you know, out on the campaign trail, we've all gotten to know each other. So I'm really excited to uh, work with those folks. Mayor. And again, Cuyahoga Falls is very similar. We're the strong mayor form of government to where city council is strictly the legislative branch. They have nothing to do with running the city. As far as my administration, the law director, finance director, my whole cabinet is hired and fired by me. They are not elected, so I control all of that. I have no city manager, I have no deputy mayor, it all falls on me. We have over 400 full-time employees. We're actually the 15th largest city in Ohio and our annual budget is right around a quarter of a billion dollars. That all falls on me directly. So it's a big city, I love it. And of course, here in the great city of Ashland, we have the form of government that has been described to you. The thing that I would share to all of the students is, when we talk about being a charter city, basically what we mean is, the city of Ashland, just like the United States, has a constitution. And that constitution outlines the different roles and responsibilities of the various elected officials here in the city of Ashland. Our charter happened to be adopted in 1914. And in 1914, the leaders of this great city put into writing that the mayor would serve as the chief executive officer of city government and the director of public safety and city services. And just like has been shared by, I think, everyone here on stage, we too have an elected finance director, an elected law director, and a five-member elected city council. 
And basically, when you read that charter, more or less, the city has been put into the role of CEO to operate our government just like a business. We're a 250 employee business, if you want to look at it that way. We have multiple divisions. The only difference is we don't necessarily have to make a profit, but we do have to stay in the black. And one of the best parts about being mayor of the great city of Ashland, or probably mayor of Mansfield, or Cuyahoga Falls, or even Barberton, is the fact that we're in situations where we can actually fix problems. We can actually address issues. And yes, we do need the support of our city council people, and some of mine are here, but for all intents and purposes, we don't have to battle it out like they do in Washington when they're trying to get a majority of 435 members to get something accomplished. When there's a pothole, we can go out and fix it. Uh, just like you mentioned, we have a variety of different department heads, all appointed by the mayor and serve at the uh, discretion of the mayor. And I guess we're very fortunate that we've got good ones because things seem to be running smoothly here in the great city. Um, could you say a little bit more about you saying that getting things done? This this lecture is actually uh, we're in partnership with Ashland University and the Bretzlaw Foundation, sort of part of a, the Faith and Society series. And one of those issues that we see certainly here in Ashland, where I live, is uh, there's a lot of faith-based organizations that do a lot of work in the community. Could you say a little bit more about how you, as mayor, work with faith-based organizations in your community? So, you know, whether it's faith-based faith or it's some type of social organization, cities can't get things done without volunteers. And if you have a strong organization of, you know, Qantas clubs or Elks or faith-based, it's important that they are involved. So, you know, I send an email out to all the clergy in town on a regular basis and give them updates because there's going to be people out there who may not trust government, but they're going to trust their clergymen. So if they can spread that information, and there's a lot of people who need help, but they may not come to the government for that. They'll go to their clergymen. So we try to keep the communication lines open with all service organizations and faith-based because we need their help, right, for communication, two-way communication, and for just helping out in the community. Yeah. So a lot of mine are going to be forward-facing answers, but... Um, I do know, you know, we have a very active faith-based community in Richland County. Um, I had a chance to interact with a lot of them through the campaigning process. Currently, I actually serve as the uh, CEO at the Richland Area Chamber in Economic Development. So I've, you know, over the last 10 years worked with a lot of our nonprofits, faith-based communities. Um, they do a lot that government will never have the opportunity to do. They have a little bit more freedom and flexibility that way. And so to me, I kind of see it as a very complementary relationship. Um, I absolutely see, um, I think there's some opportunities that we have to improve the communication that happens between those communities. Um, and as you said, I think they're a very valuable um, uh, spokes person or, or someone that can share some of the work that you're doing. And also, you know, as I've sat with pastors and, you know, they've asked, why are you doing this? I've asked them to kind of keep me in the loop on what they're hearing, because I think a lot of times people will tell them things that they maybe would never tell the mayor or another elected official. And I think it's really important to have that kind of uh, real-time feedback from your constituents. Yeah, very similar in Cuyahoga Falls. So we stay in direct contact. We have a lot of churches, different faiths, and they like to be involved. They actually participate in, we have River Cleanup Day. We have a lot of things that we can call on them and they will get us volunteers, because as you know, our time is our biggest asset. So they can draw on a lot of the people that help with the city, and they're also the eyes and ears. Most of them are residents in Cuyahoga Falls, and they can let us know someone that might have special needs or something where we can reach out to them as a government and help that person individually that we had no knowledge of. So there are a lot of, a lot of ways we use them to communicate from all the way down to the neighborhood level back to government. Very valuable. Well, as an Ashbrook scholar, you know we read a lot of books. And I'm sure you have to read a lot of books. And one of those books that we read was The Democracy in America by Alexis de Tocqueville. And in that book, and I'm going to summarize a very thick book, and the Dr. Sakanga can tell you that I didn't always read all the books that he assigned us to read. <laughs> but I will tell you, in that book, one of the things that stands out to me is, and I'm going to summarize it, Alexis de Tocqueville came to the U.S. in search of what he called America's greatness. 
He wanted to figure out what was it that made America different than all the other nations in the world. Why did she become, at such an early age, such an early stage in our nation's history, such a powerhouse globally? He came here and he searched all over the country. He visited the visit busy seaports. He visited the areas of commerce and the marketplaces and he studied them. He went out into the rural heartlands and he visited with the farmers and so on. And again, I'm summarizing, but more or less what he came down to is, you know, they're doing good things, but they're not so different than the way they're done anywhere else in the world. But then he said this. He said, when I finally got out there, though, in some of those smaller, more less populated areas, what I discovered was two things. He said, number one, their pulpits are aflame with righteousness. In other words, the pastors in all their churches are preaching a message of take care of your neighbor, take care of your community, love one another, meet everyone's needs. He said the other thing that he discovered was that in those small communities, what's happening is, he said when a problem develops, one neighbor will identify it, They'll cross the street and talk to another neighbor. Before long, they'll grab a handful of people down, up and down the neighborhood. And he said, before long, they'll come up with a solution, they'll take action, and they'll address the problem. And their government never had to get involved. Isn't it interesting that he identified as the part of America's greatness is because our pulpits are aflame for righteousness, in other words, influencing the cultures in our communities, and here in America, we still have the freedom to take care of ourselves and solve our own community problems. With that in mind, here in the city of Ashland, we are actually a very small city, geographically, small county, but we have probably, I believe at the last count, maybe 107 different churches of a variety of different denominations. And of those 107 churches, more than 37 of them are here in the great city of Ashland. And once a month, Ministry leaders from all those denominations, about 30 or 40 of them, will gather together. They spend time in prayer for our community and any special needs that we might be experiencing. And then they discuss any social issues or other problems we might be facing and try to figure out what role they can play to help us solve them. So when you ask the question, what role does the faith community play in our cities? I would say that a lot of the great blessings that the people in this room who live here and call Ashland home are experiencing are directly related to those meetings. And let me get one, one more thing. I remember that when George W. was the president, he hosted a group of social service workers at the White House. And one of the comments that he made that I've never forgot is he said, you just remember folks, our government can write checks to people but our government can't put hope in people's hearts and bring purpose to people's lives like you, the faith-based organizations, can. He's absolutely right. Uh, Ohio, as you know, has a, a home rule provision, in the state of Ohio does, in its constitution um, that is supposed to ensure that cities have all the necessary powers for self-government. I think those are almost exactly the words of the Ohio constitution. Has that been true in your experience? What has your city's relationship been like with the state of Ohio? So Barberton's used the, the home rule for, for decades, and we have a great relationship with the state of Ohio. Our state reps have changed over the years, obviously, and we, we maintain that relationship. Um, I've gone down and spoken to the governor suffer, several times, um, but we want to make sure we're staying on top of things. Uh, I think a lot of times politicians at higher levels will do things that look good on paper, but maybe they don't realize how it affects uh, the lo local communities. So we've had that experience in the past and we've had to make phone calls and, and, and kind of uh, work on that with them. I would say, um, you know, again, coming from the outside into the city, I think we have a, a very positive working relationship with our state senator, our state rep, um, even up to the federal level as well. Um, I do think it's incumbent, um, you know, it, it, we talked about this in the business community too, so often um, we see problems, uh, but we don't always go to Columbus or to Washington to share those issues, and so when the representatives are uh, taking votes, they may not. Uh, always have heard from the people that are on the front lines of it. So, um, you know, I think it's really important. One of the things I definitely plan to do is to be in Columbus and, and to be involved in mayor's forums um, and so that, uh, you know, we can really feed things back to them, um, you know, when they make decisions that are going to either tie our hands or make things harder or also to say thank you when they do things that um, make our lives easier or help us. Um, and, you know, it's very dynamic because, you know, the, if you just think about four years ago, 
pre-COVID. The world was very, very different. And so some of the things that we're talking about today just wouldn't have even been on our radar screen at that point in time. And so it's really important you have that very dynamic relationship with your representatives. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll give a little different take on it. So, as we know, there's a supermajority in Columbus, um, and I, home rule is supposed to always govern. It's in the Ohio Constitution. However, we've seen plenty of instances to where uh, we're told what we can and can't do. And I'll just throw out gun control set at the state level. We are, we are banned from doing anything locally. Um, just recently, the recreational marijuana, as you know, issue two passed. And they don't really like that, so they say, hey, you cities, you go ahead and decide if you want to do this or not. Even if it's zoning compliant, we can block that because they don't necessarily like it. But there's certain things. When the fiber started going out and the 5G and the small cell towers started popping up everywhere, we're a public power community, which means we own every telephone pole, the transformers, the substations. We even own the generating plants in Cuyahoga Falls. So we have poles that we own. We were stripped of any power on where these things can go, and they said they will be able to put the infrastructure, the AT&T, the Verizons of the world, anywhere they want to put it on public land. They can mount it on the top of Christopher Columbus's statue on top of his head. Now, we had to fight that because, again, we're supposed to have home rule, but in a lot of cases, it's stripped of the city. Um, I think it should apply at all time. We know how to govern ourselves, but that's not always the case. Back when I was a county commissioner from 2000 to 2008, we had a lot of talk in the state about unfunded mandates. It seemed as though at that particular time, the state legislature was particularly fond of writing a whole bunch of rules for our local cities and counties and telling us all these different things we would have to add to our agenda, but then they didn't send us the money to do it. And of course, as is the case with every level of government, no one is thrilled about raising someone's taxes to make sure all those duties, and especially those ideas that we don't support, are carried out in our own backyard. So unfunded mandates dominated all the legislative agendas of the Ohio Municipal League and the County Commissioners Association of Ohio at that time. Today, you don't hear as much about unfunded mandates. And I think a lot of it is because we've elected men and women to serve in the legislature that in many instances have local government experience, so they know very much what those burdens felt like when they were trying to govern our cities and villages and townships back home. But you are right. Every now and then, it does surface. And I would say your example is one of the best ones. Your example of having to allow these private fiber companies to run their lines up and down our streets in our private right of way, or in our public right of way, that can be a mess. And you might ask yourself, well, wait a second, I want that. So well, how's that a mess? Here's how it's a mess. We're in the process of probably spending what? I would say over the last several years, what, seven to ten million dollars on paving our city streets? We've got some beautiful smooth pavement here in Ashland. Well, you know what? Now you have a company come along from across the country. They come, show up at the engineer's office, have all their blueprints of where they're going to run lines under and across and over and everything else, those streets. And in many instances, if you haven't noticed, when they cut into that pavement and they make the repair, it's not as smooth as it was before they did so. Plus, it compromises the life of the pavement. So even though it might seem a little bit in the weeds, that is a real life example of how something that's happening in the state is impacting us right here in our own backyard. All that being said, I would say I personally in the last five or six years that I've been in this role have not felt that the state has is, is, uh, been a burden or stopped us from doing something we wanted to do. I will also say in the Miller household right now, the local government lobby has a very strong and powerful voice. <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you who don't know, my wife is actually one of those state representatives. <laughs> so I always make sure our voice is heard. Maybe she can help out Cuyahoga Falls, too. Yes. yes. <laughs> Wait, uh, Mayor, I'm just going to follow up on that, though. That's an interesting point. When you push back on, uh, uh, on those uh, requirements from the state, what happens? Do you, do you win those fights? Do you have to end up compromising? What happens? We did, actually. So a lot of the law directors from a lot of cities ended up in Columbus at hearings and trying to say, we need some common sense rules. Obviously, we do want the, the high-speed internet. We want the fiber. That's the wave of the future, as we know. Uh, but however, we need to have some say on where it goes, where it does not go. We were giving a f given a few rights but not a whole lot. So it's better than it started. 
to where we can deny certain things for certain reasons, but by and large, the telecoms have all the rights. And this is where it goes into having that relationship with your state representative, having your, the relationship with your congressional representative, and communities working together, because we're all dealing with the same issues. One of the great things that the state legislature has started doing these last several years is the monies that they're making available for our local communities for infrastructure improvements, they are right from day one allocating a set amount to each county in Ohio to be used for maybe water and sewer projects, brownfield cleanup, site redevelopment, and so on. And the wonderful thing about that and the change that has taken place is before it, we always had to compete for that money. So Ashland, Ohio would have to compete against a great city like Cuyahoga Falls. They had more resources. They were going to impact more people with their improvements and projects. And so it always seemed as though it was hard for a small county or a small city to win those big grants. Now what you have happening is the state legislature is saying to Ashland County, for example, here's a half a million dollars. Use it, and if you need more, then come back to us, and you can compete for those additional dollars. That has been so helpful for us, and I, I've many times thanked Mark Romanchuk and Melanie and Marilyn John and the rest of the crew for finally handing that money back to our local governments with direct allocations. We've talked a little bit about economic development, redevelopment, infrastructure. What's the greatest economic or fiscal challenge that your cities face? So I think it's a little bit of everything you just mentioned. Uh, the city of Barberton is almost 135 years old, so the infrastructure is aging. Uh, we did go to the taxpayers and, and they approved a tax increase of a quarter percent earmarked for street resurfacing. So we can use that money to go after state or federal grants that may pay 70 or 80 percent of the cost, and now we've got the, the additional money. Um, so it's really making use of those, those grant funds that are out there, OPWC and other funds that are out there for these programs. I think we're all in kind of competition for economic development. You know, I, I think it's, uh, unless you're Franklin County, having that 3,000 or 5,000 employee business moving to your community is not going to happen these days. So kind of diversifying your, your economic ecosystem and your job base is very important. City of Barberton had a company that was in town for over 100 years and they moved 10 miles to the north in Akron. Um, devastated us. $1.5 million of income tax is gone. Uh, but in Summit County, we have a, a kind of an anti-poaching agreement. So if there's incentives given to one company to move within the county, then that city has to pay the, the city that lost the business on a sliding scale some income taxes. Um, and, and so it's been working out for us a little bit. So we're all in competition. And, and what's economic development? Is that in the manufacturing business? Is it the, the investment firm? Is it a, a retail store? They're all important. So, uh, you know, I think infrastructure is a big part of economic development because as a business, you want to go where there's an investment by the community back into the community. So Mansfield is one of the um, cities in the state that went into fiscal emergency. The, the city was in it. Uh, we came out of it in 2014. So I think that looms large over our community. We're a community of about 47,000 people, um, often referred to as one of the legacy cities, you know, meaning that our, our largest days are kind of behind us until now, of course. Um, so <laughs> uh, similar, we have uh, aging infrastructure, um, also similar to what the, pub or the private sector is facing, um, issues hiring people. And so, you know, for so long, uh, public governments could hire people based on benefits. Um, that is just not working now. And so what we're seeing is, you know, uh, union con contract renegotiations having to go up on that, non-bargaining employees having to go up on that, all things that I know the private sector is dealing with. But that's, you know, I think that's probably one of the, the big things that looms large for me is trying to, um, to walk into that environment, always remembering fiscal emergency and, and kind of our bottom. Um, I will say, I think because we went through fiscal emergency, because we kind of had this, um, this moment, it was a kind of a come to Jesus moment for our community. And it made everyone say, okay, look, what we're doing is not working. Let's try to do things a little differently. And so there was some huge changes actually in economic development, in the structure, um, how we're doing that. There is a, 
I mean, immensely more collaboration uh, in the city itself, the city and the county, different cities. Um, we're, we're just so much further ahead. So, you know, obviously nobody would have wanted to go through it that way, but I think there were some positives that came out of it. And my whole thing, uh, you know, that I've based my whole campaign and, and um, my future four years on is growth. We have to grow in Mansfield and we have room for it. We were built for a larger community. We were built for a larger population. We can absorb it much easier than some of the smaller villages that are in the county. And so let's do it, let's get on there. And that will help us right size everything. Yeah, economic development is vitally important. So we basically survive off 2% income tax for everyone that works within our city borders. Uh, property tax goes mainly to the school district, as you know, and to some county levies, but we live or die by, by income tax. So jobs are extremely important, always growing that base. We have a hospital in town. We have, if anyone's heard of Purell, the hand sanitizer, anywhere in the world that came from our city with, with our water in it. So, as you can imagine, during COVID, they were doing quite well. Uh, so anyhow, we live or die by the jobs and the 2% income tax. We have not raised our taxes since 1985, and we don't plan on doing that. But to make up for that, we have to grow. We see that with inflation, there's a lot of wage growth. Well, that helps us because we get 2% of those inflated wages that people are being paid. The flip side, and you mentioned, we have six different unions, and all those contracts are up in the middle of 24. Well, number one, they see how much money we have in the bank, and then they also see what other people are making, and they're not being greedy, but we need to hire new employees. Unfortunately, we have a lot less people that want to be police officers now. And I'll tell you, in Cauga Falls, we love our police. But you turn on the national news, and sometimes you see this garbage out there. I, I won't get political, but so we love our police in Cauga Falls. However, some of our current officers are telling their sons, be an engineer, be a plumber, a welder, and they're getting out of that profession. We need them to carry that on. So we do need to pay well to be able to attract that talent, but it's a double-edged sword. We have to grow our city to be able to have the money to pay the higher wages. So we're doing well right now. We have a lot of money in the bank, and don't, don't believe that the unions don't know that. Well, first of all, let me put an explanation point on what Jody said. Jody said that her mission is to see the city of Mansfield grow. She said our city has to grow. I'm just going to say a city that is not growing is a city that is dying. You're either growing or you're dying. There's no such thing as status quo when it comes to our little villages and our cities. You're either moving forward or you're falling behind. There's no such thing as remaining stagnant. With that in mind, I would say that the biggest challenge financially for the city of Ashland, and I would suggest to just about every rural community like ours, no matter what the size, is the cost of water and sewer infrastructure. Think about it. Here in the city of Ashland, we have a wastewater treatment plant that on the dedication plaque has President Eisenhower's name on it. So more than 75 years old, and you know what? It has served us marvelously. And people have maintained that plant to the T. We're, we're investing money in it right now, so hopefully we get more decades of service out of that plant. But in an ideal world, we would replace it. But in an ideal world, the cost tag of that is about $75 million. <laughs> and there is absolutely no way we can raise that money locally to replace that plant. So in the meantime, what will we do? We will piece together those grants that we're able to get from the state and from the federal government, sometimes from the county commissioners, and we will start replacing whatever lines or components or equipment there that we can update. Uh, that's, that's what we have to do because that's what the budget allows. But what I would say to you is this. If I were running for governor, one of the major components of my platform would be we need to put more of our tax dollars into updating the infrastructure. It's fun to put it in paving new streets because you get lots of thank you notes and emails telling you what a great job you're doing. But you know what? Under every one of those lane miles of city streets, there's a water line and a sewer line that's rusting away that you never see. And we can put $20 million into those and you'll still never see it. And you'll never know we did it. But the day that your water line breaks, you'll wish we had. 
And we need more money for that, there's no question. And I will, this is gonna sound political. In my opinion, of all the many things that our leaders at the federal and state government are spending our millions and millions of dollars worth of increased tax revenues on, there's no better way they could spend that money than by sending it back to you and I to help fix the most basis infrastructure that's necessary for our quality of life and for future economic development and growth. Well, and at the end of the day, running a business a community on income taxes is the worst business model ever, right? And running it on utilities. And, and we've been told by the Ohio Supreme Court, you just can't jack up rates on utilities or building permits. You have to be able to justify that. So we just can't gouge people on things like, you know, like private companies can change things with through the board of directors. So running a, a community on income taxes, when you have very little oversight or influence on what that business does or how they function, is the worst business model ever. And I've had companies say, if we can't hire 20 people by the end of the year, our parent company is going to send us down south or overseas. Well, there's only so much a mayor or a community can do. If they can't find the people, they can't find them. So it, it's very difficult to be fiscally responsible when you have union contracts, you have needs and wants of the community, and you really have little oversight of the income taxes that are coming in. Think about the utilities that we rely on. Your electric bill, our gas bill, they've gone through the roof, haven't they? Every year they seem to grow up a significant amount. You realize the cost of delivering those services has increased. That's why they're raising the rate. That's why Rumpke's raising the rate at their landfill so we can dispose of your trash. But our city water and our city wastewater, those utilities, they're also going up by the same percentages. However, you would not love us and I would not want to pay it if we raise those rates to keep up with the actual cost of delivering all those services. The utility companies do it, and they don't get voted out. No one decides to change leadership of the company. Locally, your city council people and your mayors and so on, if we actually raise those rates to keep up with the cost of delivery of all these services, there's no way any of us would be on the stage the next time they did this panel. <laughs> Here's a question from the audience, and I think this goes to something you were saying, Mr. Mayor. Um, how do you keep personnel in the city, especially when there's so much competition now, labor shortage really in many ways for skilled labor uh, with private industry, and they ask particularly about safety services like fire and police. So that's been a challenge. You know, uh, when I started as mayor in Barberton, it was you know, a little Johnny who grew up down the street, now works for the city, and has a 30-year career. Uh, the younger people are job hopping, right? And if they, they're more mobile, they're willing to travel for work. So it is difficult. You know, on the safety side, we've looked at lateral transfers. So if you've been a, a police officer, firefighter in another community, and, and you've been there for a number of years, take the test, you can transfer over laterally. We've looked at hiring bonuses. We've looked at, you know, what can we do to, uh, to entice people? We're starting to work with our high school to give them another pathway. So we'll go in and we'll talk to the high school students. This is what it means to be a city clerk or in the building department or planning department. Uh, this is what a civil service test is. And then we'll bring them out to the street department and wastewater treatment plant with the teachers. So this is why you need this type of math to work in this department. So now it's real life for them. So if they're not going to go to college, they're not going to go to a trade school, they're not going to go to the military, here's a, a possible pathway to go work for the city. And then you get back into economic development, if they're living and working in the same community, you can count that rotation of a dollar seven to nine times within the community. So it's a win-win-win for everyone. Well, I don't know that yet, but <laughs> what I would say, just to put an emphasis on, um, we are very understaffed in our police in Mansfield. And if you're somewhat local, you're probably aware we also have a rising crime issue. Um, and. Uh, you know, I know I'm going to walk right into the middle of that. And, you know, it, this isn't a money problem, um, the policing issue. The, the money is there to pay the officers. We cannot get the officers to come. They have done a signing bonus for lateral transfers. Um, that has brought some in, but you're also constantly, we're a department of 
if it was fully staffed around 80, and there's always people retiring. So you, you kind of go ahead, then you go backwards, then someone else puts a signing bonus in another community and they jump ship. So, um, you know, this is definitely something that we're going to have to uh, take on head on. Um, and I do think something that maybe we haven't done as well is connect in with the schools. That's kind of the longer term fix. The shorter term fix is we need people in those because right now what's happening is our, uh, you know, uh, it's a very base patrol level. I did a, a ride along about a month ago and I was asking the officer, he was great, answered all my, my uh, dumb questions throughout the eight hours that I was with him, but I said, well, what would it look like if we were fully staffed just with the officers that, that we're authorized for? And he said, you know, ma'am, of course that's how they pronounce <laughs> Uh, Ma'am, we would be able to do a lot more proactive policing instead of just responding. And uh, it is absolutely, it, it's funny, over the course of the campaign, that has, I would say, become the number two issue. And it, when I started running for mayor a year ago, we were not talking about crime as a major thing. It was, it was still an issue, but um, we've had a series of shootings. And so it's really, um, it's going to be one of my biggest uh, uh, things that I will need to, to concentrate on after the first of the year. We're fully staffed right now, but as I mentioned, hiring police officers is a little tough than it used to be. We used to have 150 applicants. We would narrow it down, whittle it down to 25 or 30, and then we would pick the best one. Very stringent testing. So obviously, we do the written test. We do psychological tests. We do polygraph tests. We check for any of the biases, the discrimination. We only hire the best. Well, we're ending up now with maybe three or four to choose from, from that original pool, and that's scary. We're still finding the best cops that we can hire, but the pool's shrinking for the reasons I had mentioned. A lot of the fathers are telling their sons to do anything but this. We're okay other than some of the professionals. We have a bunch of civil engineers on staff. It's very hard to find them. Uh, we actually pay. You can't find anyone with a CDL. So we need snow plows, we need all that, we have our own water department, we have our own sanitation. So we pay for them to go to a training school. They do not have to pay us back if they stay five years or more. If they do quit, then they have to pay it back, graduated, so we get our money back because they have the CDL in their pocket. We don't want them to leave with that. So we've had to use different things. We also have in our community a very large influx of uh, the Bhutanese and Nepalese. So sometimes there's a language barrier, sometimes there's not. So we start what's, what's called a welcome, welcoming workforce commission to where the employers, not only the city, but the employers need to recognize their holidays. They need to offer time off. They need to understand that they have a different culture and they need to cater to that if they want to fill all their staffing that they need. So we're always reaching out to that too. But as far as the city goes, it's a challenge. We're getting a little scared with the police department, with the applicants, but we're fully staffed right now. Fire's easy. Everyone loves a firefighter. So there's, there's a big long line. And we pay extremely well. And one more thing, uh, anyone in this room that wants to come work for local government, one of the few places you still have a defined benefit pension plan. That's gone away in private industry. Um, so we still have that. Basically free health care prescription drug costs, so a lot of those perks come with that nice salaries. A lot of our workers make over six figures with overtime. So you can make a good buck, free health care, essentially free, and then a great pension when you do retire. So it's still a great place to work, and I would encourage everyone to look into local government before you go take off to Austin, Texas. <laughs> Actually, I might get an application from you, Abbott. All those six-figure jobs there in Cuyahoga Falls. If you're looking for a six-figure salary in Ashton City Government, you will have to look long and hard. All right, but there are a few of them with overtime. You're right. The thing that comes to mind as I hear everyone talk is, I see the city of Ashland as one body with many parts. And I see the city government as the heart of this body. And if the city government is unhealthy, all the other parts will suffer. The school system will suffer, the nonprofit community, the business community, the church community, everyone else will suffer if we don't get it right in City Hall and have a strong, healthy heart, the city government. And so with that in mind, we're going to be very pragmatic. We want some of the most talented people around, the best hearted, biggest hearted people around working in City Hall. And one of the things that we are certainly starting to recognize is the fact that that means you're going to have to raise your wages. 
Over these last two years, there have been multiple times when our HR director has come to the office showing me what we pay someone to do a serious, important job compared to what they could make if they were simply working at one of our fast food restaurants, which are also important jobs because I utilize those drive throughs But when you compared what their duties and responsibilities and the weight of what they were doing when they came into the office every day to what you might do if you were cooking a hamburger in a kitchen, it does not make sense that we're paying what we're paying. And so to the extent we can, we have started raising rages in classifications. We've done all of the things you've heard here, offer those various incentives with the exception of a bonus. We haven't offered a signing bonus to anyone, but offering lateral transfers and so on. But quite candidly, right now, I would say we're doing pretty well. Our police and fire are staffed. Um, certainly there's always retirements that open up a position. But I think this all fits into a larger story that we're trying to write in the Ashen community in. That is, we want to be the most livable city around. The place where everyone wants to live. We won't be the fanciest. We won't be the richest. We won't have the tallest skyscraper. We may not even have falls on the river downtown. But you know what? We can have an extremely safe, peaceful, and high quality of life with great family-friendly experiences all year round. And if we offer that, I'm convinced that you know what? Someone who wants to be a police officer is going to say Ashland would be a great place to be a police officer. You know what? Someone wants to work in uh, an environmental type related work with water and wastewater, Ashland would be a great place for me and my wife or my spouse to settle down and raise a family. And I think quite candidly we're seeing that unfold as we speak with the filling of all the new housing units uh, that we've built in these last several years. Uh, here's a question that I had, but also sent in from someone in the audience. Um, they say, a city like Columbus and Franklin County is growing rapidly. Is the future of Ohio in large cities like Columbus or in smaller cities like yours? You know, it, it's tough. Uh, I think we can all talk about our communities and how we've grown and, and we've had good times and bad times during the Great Recession and COVID. And uh, Franklin County and Columbus never slowed down. Uh, you know, it helps to have a university with, you know, 50,000 plus students. Um, but there's a lot going on down there and, you know, having the state house there, that helps. Um, so I think it's a mix of both. You know, we're all fighting for residents and for, for jobs. Um, and, and there's a lot of money out there at the state level and the federal level. And like you said, you know, it's not all through competition these days. Um, so there's a lot of growth at different levels going on throughout the state. Can we, we compete with Franklin County or Columbus? I don't believe so, no. But can we get some of those residual businesses that might work with some of the companies in the Columbus area? Possibly. Um, you know, if you look at Amazon, typically around Amazon locations, fulfillment centers, there are some residual businesses that, that pop up. So you kind of got to pick and choose, and it's a little bit of both, of small communities and, and large. Well, we're definitely feeling Columbus coming north uh, in Richland County. There's a lot of people, I mean, so so the great thing about growth is lots of people are coming to community, there's lots of jobs. The the tougher thing is there's there's issues with growth. It's very hard to find affordable housing uh, in Columbus. There's, it's, it's hard to find just housing, period. Um, and so we're actually seeing people come up to Richland County to, to live, and they're just accepting a commute, or you know, at this point, now sometimes you can just remote work for, for most of your time. I can be from my door in Mansfield to Polaris in 45 minutes and to downtown in an hour, and it's a very easy commute. And so we're definitely seeing that. We're, we, we're, our strategy, we want to try to take advantage of that, but we do not want to be overtaken by Columbus. We want to maintain our independence, of course. I think Mansfield's a nice size that, you know, we often say we have big city amenities with a small town feel. You can walk into the coffee shop as I do every morning and see people that you know, um, but we have you know live theater and, and all sorts of uh, arts and culture in our community. I will say this though: I think that the you know the renaissance of Ohio, the renaissance of our country, is going to come in smaller communities. And I also think that's where the um, some of the the turmoil that we're seeing in Columbus and Washington on a political level will get fixed at the local level. I um, you know people ask me why did I run for mayor? Why you know you know should I 
like do something bigger. And I'm like, I am 100% all in on local government because as Matt said earlier, you can fix things. People, and if, if I don't get your street plowed, you're gonna tell me about it in Kroger the next day. Um, and I absolutely think, you know, most of the time at the local level, very little of what we're doing in, is getting voted on along a party line. Everybody, whether you're a Republican or Democrat, wants clean streets, they want safe streets, they want safe water, and they want jobs. Sometimes, you know, maybe there's a, di uh, uh, a difference of, of opinion on how to get it, but I've been attending city council meetings in Mansfield. We have a, a divided city council um, uh, on both parties. I don't think I can think of a single vote that ever went party line there. They're not all um, unanimous, although I would still say to that, probably 95% are unanimous. Um, and so I really think local government, if, if uh, we are functioning well, and we need to kind of push that feeling up a little further, and that's where the renaissance will come. I think Columbus will continue to grow. It's the jobs. People come from all over the country to work at some of the great companies that are there, and it's going to continue to, to expand, I'm sure. The thing at the local level, and I mentioned, so all the talent in this room, we need you to stay here. <laughs> Because if not, we get the brain drain and now you're gone, Austin, Texas, or some cool city. I realize that we need to cater to you. We need to be a cool city. We need to have all the amenities, the park system. We need the kayaking, the inner tubing, the rock climbing, the bicycling, all those things that you like, we better provide it or you're gone. Now, that once you're here, it used to be you would follow to where the jobs were. If there's some talent in an area, there's a bunch of mechanical engineers, companies will come here. And also, with so many people working from home, you don't have to move away. So we need to provide all that fun stuff for the next generation coming up because we need your talent, we need you to stay. And I know you can go anywhere in the country, but we really need to look towards the future and that is you, you are our future. I think I'll answer the question this way. For those of you who live here, you already know this, but for those of you who don't, listen carefully. The last major investment in housing here in the city of Ashland took place two years ago. It was approximately $44 million, and the developer from the Columbus area built 192 market rate apartments out by Charles River on George Road on the US 250 corridor, complete with the swimming pool and the workout facility and otherwise. Those apartments rent far beyond anything that everyone has ever known here in the city of Ashland when it comes to what we pay for rent for a one and a two and a three bedroom apartment. And when the owner of the company, the developer, launched that project, he said to me, he said, all of our market analysts are telling us that they're concerned that your city will be able to fill these units. After all, there's so many, 200, and they are at this price point. We don't know that we're gonna be able to do it. Before he had it complete, the last of the 12 buildings was built. When they hadn't even put down the pavement in the new parking lot that would accommodate all those new residents of this apartment complex, he called and he said, I just wanna tell you, you guys were right. He said, we already have a waiting list for all of these apartments. He said, we've already filled it and we haven't even opened the doors. And he said, this is what's interesting. He said, almost everyone is from out of state or Mansfield. <laughs> Until That now. was before Jody got <coughs> the job of mayor. <laughs> but what does that mean? Well, first of all, we all can try to figure out what does that mean? Why are they choosing Ashland? Well, I'll tell you why I think they're choosing Ashland. Number one, people have more mobility and flexibility in their work arrangements these days. So you can come to someplace like Ashland. Number two, Ashland is in a wonderful location on an interstate highway, halfway between Cleveland and Columbus, not far from Akron and Cuyahoga Falls, Canton area, all those big city amenities easy drive away, nice restaurants, big chains, you can go just about any direction and you'll find them in no time and it's not even a hassle because you'll never deal with backed up traffic. Furthermore, in a world that's growing increasingly chaotic, when there's high crime rates in all the major metropolitan areas and we see more and more civil unrest in the streets and we seem to be having an awful hard time getting along with one another, wouldn't it make sense that these small outlying communities that are still peaceful, still fairly united, decent cost of living, lots of wonderful amenities that you and your family can enjoy, wouldn't it make sense that we're gonna grow increasingly appealing as time goes on? 
Our biggest challenge will be to hold on to all of those attributes that are drawing everyone here and not lose them as we continue to grow. Uh, this is the last question, but it's a question that a number of people sent in on their cards, uh, which is, uh, and I'll read this one here, with all the criticism that mayors get for pretty much everything, the way the person puts it, why would you ever want to be mayor? <laughs> What's the best thing about it? Well, how long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> you know, with social media, the, the, the criticism just doesn't stop, right? And like our city council, you'll get the same three people that show up. Yet there's all this disagreement and criticism, but nobody shows up. I have open office hours uh, every quarter. Nobody shows up. I get a lot of work done because nobody shows up. Um, for me, you know, I was born and raised in Barberton. Uh, my father was mayor back in the 80s. My uncle was a municipal judge, so he was judge, judge. Um, so for me, my background's accounting and finance, and, and I never thought I would get into politics. Actually, my father told me, don't run for mayor, and you know, I, you don't listen to your parents. Um, but it's, it, it means a lot more to me we, when we can improve a street or downtown or a park. You know, that's a, a street or a business or a park that my grandfather played in and my father and, and me and now my son. And so it means a lot to me. Um, but you take it personally. And so I, I get upset when people criticize, but they don't want to be educated on things. Um, and so I, I make it a point if someone calls into the office to, to criticize and ask questions, uh, I'll come out to your house and talk to you. And 100% of the time when I go out and I meet with someone and I explain the different variables and the different things that we're dealing with, they get it. But they're very quick to, to voice their opinion before getting all the information. Um, and, and our hands are tied a lot of the times. There may be a lot of grant funds out there, but there's very strict criteria at times. And you, know, you are fighting with the bigger cities. You are to, to get that grant money. Um, and there's a lot that goes into it. So it's just not as easy as just applying for things. So it's getting the, the, the public educated on the process. And, and I tell people, you have to trust in your local government. There's ethics boards. There's oversight. There's these types of things. Um, just get involved and, and you know, get educated on the process. Mm -hmm. So I would say, obviously, I haven't taken office yet, but why I decided still, there's to There's still run, time, Joy. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I have had the question, why in the world would you do this? And did you ever see this in your life? And no, the answer was no, I never saw that. I, I've been in the Chamber of Commerce kind of economic development industry for 20 years. It's a higher profile position. So people have said over the years, you should run for office. And I was always like, uh, no, thank you. I would never want to get into politics. What started to change my mind, though, was I began to see just what a difference um, a great mayor can make in their community. And this is going to come from an, an odd place, but we did a project in Mansfield called Mansfield Rising. Uh, we sent 15 local citizens, I was one of them, I was one of the leaders, to the South by Southwest Festival in Austin, Texas. Uh, and we came back and wrote a plan for um, uh, investing in our downtown. And it just so happened that year they had a whole track on cities. Um, it, I wish we, we didn't know that in advance, but it just was a lucky coincidence. And I sat in, in several sessions listening to mayors talk about how they were impacting workforce development, jobs, people's lives, infrastructure. And I just remember sitting there thinking, I guess I never really thought about how much um, power you can uh, wield. And I don't mean that in a maniacal way of any sort, but just to really make a difference. I love to lead. I love, in fact, some of the, uh, part of me thinks I have the best job currently at the chamber in the whole county. It's so fun. I get to work with so many great leaders, but I really think the ability, I, I have no power. I can't make anything happen at the chamber and at the city, of course, working with city council and, and the other elected officials, I can make changes that will impact people's lives. And that's really what made me do it. I believe so passionately in the future of Mansfield. Um, I'm, I put my whole career and my life, uh, you know, so to speak, on the line to do this. But I will tell you, it is no joke putting yourself out there for public consumption. You know, I've had people comment on all sorts of things, tell me all sorts of things. The day I got elected, I got an anonymous letter in the mail. So just telling me things that I need to fix already. So, you know, I mean, I, I I'm on the front side of this. I'm sure I'll have a lot more to add. But you know, I, again, I really think um, the power of local government, that's what made me decide to do it. 
Well, I did 12 years on city council. I was council president, and I was approached to run for mayor, and I told him, you're out of your mind. So I did not run, and the mayor at the time was unopposed. For the first time in the history of the city, there was no mayor's race. Well, four years later, they came knocking, and these were the political, powerful people. So I realized that I had a ton of ideas, and I could make the city better. I'm a lifetime resident. I've been here 60 years, and I thought I could make a difference. Now, I learned early on that every city is a brand. We're just like a company. You're a brand, we're a brand, and we all love each other, but we're still in direct competition. And my job, one of my biggest roles as mayor, is to be the city's biggest cheerleader. So you can criticize me all you want. Don't criticize Cuyahoga Falls, because I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna tell you why you're wrong. So we're not perfect, we work on our flaws, we always promote the positive, and that's my job. My job is to tell our story to everyone I meet, everywhere I go, because if I mention, I won't pick on cities, if I say, let's go have dinner tonight in East Cleveland. Again, no disrespect, but a lot of you might say, I don't think I'm really comfortable going there. But you maybe have not been to East Cleveland, but that's your perception of it. It's their job to change your mind. It's their job to tell their story, what a great city it may be. So that's what we all do. We're the biggest cheerleaders for our city, and we will never stop doing that. You can criticize me, but don't criticize the city. So the question, why do you want to be mayor? It's hard to believe it, but it's been 30 years since I attended my first Ashbrook event. I attended as a 16-year-old student from Hillsdale High School. My English teacher made the arrangements for the first time that I came to the Ashbrook Center and met Charlie Parton at the time. He sat down with me, and before I left, he handed me the book uh, Machiavelli, The Prince, told me to go read it and come back and report. And I remember that I had never read any book like that, I can promise you. I, I liked magazines with lots of colorful pictures. <laughs> And I will tell you, when I came back and he sat down with me, he said, so what do you think? And I said, well, according to that book, the ends justify the means. And he sat back and laughed and he says, well, you got it. And uh, so uh, from that point, let me tell you, the first event that I attended here was with Margaret Thatcher when Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher came to Ashen University. At that time, there is absolutely no way the mayor of the great city of Ashen could afford that ticket to come here. But it just so happened I was the lawn and pool boy for Harry and Patty Gill, who owned National Latex at the time. And Mr. Gill was on the board here at the university, and Mrs. Gill, of course, had a table here, and she knew I wanted to come, so she called catering and made arrangements for me to work in catering the night of the event so that I could come, and I didn't even have to pay. They paid me. And all the staff here knew that I was into politics, so they let me come out when Margaret Thatcher, it's like we're on first name basis, when Prime Minister Thatcher was speaking, and I got to sit in a chair in the very back against the wall. And you know what was even better? At one point, Governor Voinovich dropped his fork, and they said, Matt, would you like to take him his new fork? <laughs> and he was sitting right up here at one of the front tables. So that's 30 years ago. It's hard to believe. But at that time, I will tell you, I followed everything that was happening in Washington and in the state of Ohio. I had the directory of the State House of Representatives and the state senators on my nightstand. I read their bios every night before I went to bed. I was absolutely consumed with wanting to be involved in politics and American government. And if you would have asked me at that time, I would have been on a path to Washington. I would have been on my way to Washington. And many of you know that are sitting here that are from Ashland, and uh, thank you so much for your support, I did run for Congress three times. And the great irony is, before I launched one of my first campaigns for Congress, I got a call from then Mayor Bill Strine. He's actually in the audience. I didn't know he was going to be here today, so this is a tribute to him. He had been a successful finance director for the city and I believe a great mayor, one of the most visionary mayors we had. We have an industrial park and an economic development office because he put the money to that cause. Well, he invited me over. I was a county commissioner at the time, called me in his office and I remember him asking me, he said that he was thinking about stepping down as mayor and he was wondering if I had ever considered running for mayor. And when he said that, I'm thinking, no, no. I would not, I'm not at all interested in mayor. And uh, it, didn't even, it didn't even register. I was flattered that he, because I respected him so much, would say something like that, but had no interest, because I'm going to Washington. Well, I ran three times for Congress. 
and each time won three out of the four counties and only missed it by a small margin of votes considering I was absolutely on a shoestring budget. Well, you know what? By the time that third loss rolled around, I couldn't have cared less whether I was involved in politics or not. I remember going into my office at the Salvation Army and praying, Lord, I pray I don't have to go to another political event for many years. Well, the odd thing is, when I got up off my knees, it wasn't long after that, that the door opened for me to go to ODOT under John Kasich. I became a deputy director of the Department of Transportation. And at that time, one of the first edicts that John Kasich put out when he was still a Republican was you could not attend Republican events. And so with that in mind, I thought, ah, oh, now I have a reason not to go to any of those political functions, Marv. And so I stopped going. Well, somewhere over that next seven years, that uh, seed and interest in American politics and government and public service did come back and felt with all my heart that you should run for mayor. And uh, originally ran for city council knowing that our mayor wouldn't be in office for much longer, so I wanted to learn the inner ropes of how it take, what it takes to operate the city. And then after that, of course, ran for mayor and was elected the 54th mayor of the great city of Ashen, Ohio. I will tell you that I am someone that believes without a shadow of a doubt that the creator that's referred to in that Declaration of Independence also created me. And he has a plan for each of us, and if we seek him, he will lead us there. And it's very interesting. Today, I serve as the mayor of a city of 25,000 25, people. And some might say, you know, <laughs> that position doesn't matter. Well, you know what? You walk up and down the streets of the city of Ashland, you ask people what the mayor's done for their city, and I bet they can probably tell you very specifically something that has happened in this city that they're so pleased with. Then ask them who their congressman is and what they've done to make their life better. They'll be lucky to be able to name the person, and chances are if they can name them, they probably won't have a lot of positive things to say. Certainly won't be able to cite anything they've done for them. Maybe there's a lesson to be learned. The way to turn around the great United States of America is one community at a time. All those principles that you're learning about and all these many texts that you have to read about, freedom will be kept alive right here on the front lines. And hopefully over time, as our lights shine brighter, we'll be able to send an even brighter light across the nation. Well, I want to thank you all for coming and thank these dedicated public servants. Thank you all. Thank you for listening to this episode of The American Idea. If you enjoyed this episode, remember to subscribe at Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and leave a five-star review. If you want to learn more or get involved in Ashbrook's vital work, visit our website, ashbrook.org. <laughs>